Well, hello and welcome back. I'm Guy Stevens, the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. And you are with us here again for another Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint uh, live series. So excited to have you here. We've got another fantastic show on store for you today. Uh, let me tell you first a little bit about kind of who I am and who the Alliance is. If you don't know who we are, the Alliance was started almost five years ago. In fact, we're coming up to an anniversary here very soon. Uh, really started initially around the issue of restraint seclusion happening in schools across the country. Uh, quickly, though, our, our mission continued to grow, and uh, it wasn't just restraint seclusion. It's restraint seclusion, suspension, expulsion, corporal punishment, all the things that are often being done to kids very often in the name of, uh, in the name of uh, behavior. And we've continued to kind of evolve. We don't really honestly want to see restraint seclusion happening anywhere, uh, so we've worked in other settings as well. But a lot of our work is really around uh, informing changes in policy and informing changes in law and reducing and eliminating the use of uh, punitive discipline, outdated behavioral management approaches, and uh, really doing better and uh, seeing better outcomes, not only for kids, but teachers and staff as well. Uh, we are really excited today to have with us Courtney Hart, who I've known for quite some time now. Courtney's going to be here to talk to us about the PDA profile of autism. Uh, our, uh, our title today is Opposition it Isn't Always Defiance. It's going to be kind of a brief introduction into the PDA profile of autism, which uh, I know we are hearing more and more about. And uh, here in the United States, I think there's uh, more and more interest in, in PDA. And uh, this, I think, is really timely as well. So I do want to let you know that, as always, today's session is being recorded. So we always record these sessions. Uh, so if you're able to watch it live, fantastic. But if you can't watch the whole thing live, know that you can uh, you can come back later and you can watch it. It's available on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, so you can go back and, and watch it that way as well. We also make it available as an audio podcast. So if you want to listen to it or listen on the go, uh, you can listen to it on uh, Spotify or Apple Music, wherever you listen to music. So there's a lot of different options in terms of uh, being able to go back and, and listen to this if you're not able to hear the whole thing right now. And I see a number of people have already joined us live, and it's always great to see you live. And uh, all of those of you that are, um, you know, that come back week after week, I know there's a lot of people that really make an effort to tune in every week. And, and thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for being part of the community. Thank you for being part of our audience. You probably know what I'm going to ask you to do next because I ask you to do every week. But uh, if you would, in the chat, let us know who you are and where you're from. It's always fantastic to see who's joining us, where they're joining us from. Uh, of course, we have an audience uh, from around the world. And uh, I always love to share with our guests that we've got people joining us from Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, you know, Canada, all over, all over the world. So let us know uh, in the chat who you are and where you're joining us from. I do want to mention to you as well that we have uh, two sponsors for today's show. Uh, and it's been really helpful to have sponsors for our podcast because the sponsors help us not only to, to put the show together and to be able to host it and, and make it available to you uh, in the long run, but it also really kind of helps the organization to do the work that we think is really critical. So I want to begin by introducing you to our first sponsor. And our first sponsor actually uh, have a tremendous book out there called Without Restraint. And the sponsor is actually Robert Delena and his son, Ryan Delena. This book, Without Restraint, uh, is a book that will probably resonate with many of you that may have had experiences with restraint and seclusion in schools. Uh, the book is really a story, um, and you might have seen the subtitle here, How Skiing Saved My Son's Life. Really the story of um, Ryan Delena and kind of the difficulty that he had in school. And I'm gonna read you a little bit here from the, the inside cover, just to give you an idea of what the book is about. Uh, As a child, Ryan, Ryan Delena had difficulty controlling his emotional outbursts. This led to placement in therapeutic schools that relied on detrimental methods of behavior modification, such as physical restraints. Nothing helped from therapy to heavy medication. Then by age nine, Ryan was voluntarily committed into a mental hospital for further evaluation. His parents, Rob and Mary Beth, were counseled to place him in a group home. They refused. Two years earlier, Rob had made an impulsive decision to take Ryan skiing and he had discovered a different child than the version experts were so sure about. By the second day of skiing, Ryan uh, was executing advanced runs, and with each achievement in the winters that followed, Rob began to question the path laid out for his son by the professionals who were paid to help but only judged him. He later convinced Mary Beth 
that they should fight the medical and educational complexes over Ryan's care and school placement. And together they fostered the freedom Ryan needed to pursue his dream and become a professional ski mountaineer. Written in two voices, without restraints, a joint father-son memoir told by both both pain and levity, struggle and strength, adventure and heart. Uh, it's a story of a misunderstood boy, a father's growth, and a shared love for the outdoors that formed an unbreakable bond. Um, you know, as I read this, there was so much that that I related to, uh, you know, within their story, and it's a it's a fantastic book. Uh, I think a book that gives a lot of hope. So anyway, I want to thank Robert and Ryan for being sponsors of our podcast today. Uh, and appreciate their their book and sharing their story with the world. We've got uh, one additional sponsor here today as well that I want to mention, and that is Supportable Solutions. Many of you know Supportable Solutions probably from Connie Persick, who is a friend, a collaborator, a colleague who's doing amazing work, who recently launched a new product called the Y Toolkit, uh, which is really aimed at uh, really getting to the deeper why of behavior and helping to see children differently and of course respond to children differently so i'm going to play a short video here from uh, connie about the toolkit and the work that they do behaviors are signals to the deeper whys the why toolkit a tool built for and approved by teachers parents and administrators that can both assess and support individuals struggling with behaviors connie has created a document that turns typical behavioral documents upside down and replaces them with a deep dive into what really matters, how to support each child within a compassionate and relational framework based on their individual differences. The Y Toolkit was found to decrease seclusion and restraint by 21% in a year-long pilot study. Portable solutions for their sponsorship, and again, uh, I, I know Connie well, and the work that she's doing is really phenomenal. And Supportable Solutions is a, a great, a great sponsor, and has really supported the work that we're doing here at the Alliance. I also wanted to give a quick shout out here. Uh, there was a quote there from Mona De La Hook, and I wanted to give a shout out to Mona De La Hook. Uh, many of you that uh, know Mona's story know that she suffered a brain aneurysm, uh, was in a coma for a period of time, and uh, is now at home and on her road to recovery, and has been sharing some things recently on social media. Uh, we love Mona. She's a, an amazing person and uh, so glad to hear that she's uh, she's doing well. And uh, I think you're going to be hearing more and more, hopefully in the coming days. And I look forward myself to, uh, to connecting with Mona, but just wanted to give a, a quick shout out there. So let me go ahead and uh, now uh, bring up our very important guest that we have here with us today, uh, Courtney Hart. And uh, Courtney, I feel like you and I have uh, known each other for a while. Uh, and I'm always excited to see you. And you, you, I think we, we started having a conversation, uh, not even about the podcast as we got on here. And it, it's always a pleasure to see you. I'm going to give our, our, um, uh, you know, our viewers here a little bit of background on who you are. Uh, and of course, um, you are a licensed uh, clinical social worker. And, and remind me here, LCSW, I know what that is. What, what's the C on the end there? Licensed clinical social worker. So it's actually just Maryland's version. So it's okay. actually licensed certified social worker clinical. So it's okay. The <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I, I, I hear you. Uh, yeah. And uh, of course you founded Healing Heart uh, Wellness in 2018, a pediatric mental health and wellness practice uh, where she and her team uh, and their uh, two therapy dogs uh, specialize in supporting anxious ADHDers and autistic families through uh, parent consultations, ADHD autism assessments, individual therapy and interest-based social groups. In addition to your work at Healing Heart Wellness, uh, Courtney also runs Therefore I Learn, offering children's yoga, uh, teacher training and mindfulness training for educators. Uh, when you aren't working, and, and uh, I know you work a lot, uh, we can find you, uh, let's see, starting random projects at home, playing fetch with your dogs, scouring the internet for research topics of interest, reading, playing video games, and listening to music. Um, Courtney, it's always a pleasure to, to see you, and uh, uh, I've always found that uh, you and the work that you do um, is is so uh, aligned with so many of the beliefs that we have here in terms of, uh, you know, here at the Alliance. So welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's definitely an honor to be even on a podcast with you. Like you said, we've known each other for so long. 
that it's really evolved watching the work you're doing and just being able to be a part of it even a little bit. It's really yeah, cool. yeah. And, and and what's interesting here is that um, we're we're of course both in Maryland. While we've not mm -hmm. met in person, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're both here in Maryland, and uh, you know, so that's kind of kind of funny. Uh, I'm going to just share a couple of things here real quick. And again, if you are watching live, please feel free in the chat to let us know who you are and where you're from. And I'll share a couple of these real quick with you. Uh, we've got a, a neurodivergent by nature, uh, Pam. Mm -hmm. uh, so excited to be here from beautiful West Coast of Canada on the, uh, okay, gotcha. So Pam is here with us today uh, from Canada. I've got somebody else here from Maryland, Faith. Uh, I've got uh, Rosalie here from Colorado, the happy uh, medium approach. Uh, good to see you, Rosalie. Uh, I've got Chantel also here from Canada. And of course, Chantel, like Pam, is actually a volunteer with the Alliance Against Inclusion and Restraint in Canada. Uh, and Chantel is our lead volunteer uh, in Canada. And uh, let's see, uh, they've been on a vacation from Florida in Florida. So looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, we've got uh, Jay here, Jay Angel here as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we've got a number of people. Uh, I've got another parent, Heather, from the Seattle area. Um, so a number of people joining us already. And of course, hopefully we'll get some more as we continue on here. So welcome to all of you that have jumped on and uh, thanks for being here today. So um, we've got an exciting presentation today and uh, you and I talked about this before. I'm going to bring up your presentation here and you're going to um, you're going to kind of take over. I'm going to stick mm -hmm. around though and you've agreed that you're happy to take uh, questions as we go. Mm -hmm. um, so if people have questions, they'll be able to put those in the chat and uh, I will try to politely interrupt you <laughs> with questions. And, and I might jump in with questions as well, as long as you don't mind, because um, it's always fun to have that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of conversation. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your slide deck here. And uh, your slide deck is up. And I'm going to then hand the reins over to you to take over. So I will be muted here. Um, but as questions come in or something hits me, uh, I might pop up. And of course, if you need anything, just say the word and I'll be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And just so you know, Guy, you can just interrupt me whenever you feel like there's an opportunity. It might be hard to find that gap in space. Okay, so once I get so, started, so just uh, like I'll try to do there. it as gently as I can. But okay. if, if I need to, I'll, I'll just go in with a quick, uh, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's good. All right, sounds um, good. All awesome. right, take it away. Yeah. So thank you all for being here and being with us, listening. So um, just going to start with a little bit of an introduction about the presentation and what to expect and then dive right in. Uh, again, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we might be able to get to them. So to start, I always like to give everybody just a little bit of an overview of like what I hope you get out of listening to me talk for a little while and who I am and what I bring into the work that I'm doing. Um, so I am a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also a registered yoga teacher and registered children's yoga teacher. Um, but I've been working in pediatric mental health for my entire career. My career actually started out in a behavioral health hospital, transitioned to school social work, and then navigated to private practice where I opened my own private practice in 2018. And then I spent the last five years growing it through 2023, where I actually made a decision at the end of the year that I needed to return back to solo practice because I was at a pretty high level of burnout. Um, but one of the things that I really like to do is I really like to help share information with people and give them resources so they can help kind of navigate what they're learning. So my hope is that even though I can't give you all the information here today, and I really tried, I packed in probably way too much information into this presentation, even though I can't get you to get all that info now, like I hope that you're able to leave with this understanding of like, okay, this is what PDA seems like it is. And like, these are maybe some assumptions I had about it or could have had about it. And now I kind of have a different understanding of how to look at behavior, how to consider that maybe this is a nervous system disability instead of willful defiance and how to maybe help somebody who has a PDA nervous system. Other things that I bring along into this presentation besides my professional experience that I think are pretty important to note are that I do operate from a neurodiversity affirming perspective. I see PDA as valid. So although I recognize the different controversies and how there's a need for more research, like I am like, okay, if people say PDA is a thing, cool, it's a thing. Um, I also myself have a neurodivergent nervous system. I was uh, diagnosed as a teen with ADHD. 
identified as an adult to be autistic and PDA is something that I'm like, I really align with that nervous system. And also I've lived a long life so far, 30 some years, and a lot of other things have happened in that time that it would just be too definite for me to 100% say like, yes, this is something that from the day I existed was a nervous system that I had. And so I kind of just divert back to like, I'm neurodivergent. I have these answers. I don't have these other answers, but like here I am in all of myself. Um, I also bring in that I'm white, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual, I've had access to wealth. So my take on all of this is gonna look really different than other people's. My experiences are really different. And I think that whenever we're listening to somebody and they could be seen to be an expert, it's really important that we continue to learn and check sources and talk to people who have lived experience. And so my hope is you don't walk away being like, oh, Courtney, she knows it. Wow, I learned from her. No, like, oh, Courtney, she made me curious about this. And now I'm ready to go learn about this on my own. And I, I had to say, I, I, I love I love how you're framing that. Because yeah. I mean, it really is it really is so critical to, um, you know, I mean, starting conversations is great, but the, the curiosity and and also, I mean, the, the voice of lived experience. And of course, you're coming at us not only with, you know, a professional background, but with lived experience. And, and I appreciate yeah. you framing it this way. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I no. say, and I have to ask you, what, what are the names <laughs> of your dogs? I just have to ask that. Um, so actually, this is only one of my two dogs okay. on the okay. left. It's Franklin. And then that's Ernie. Ernie is uh, one of my former employees, therapy dog. Uh, okay, gotcha. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Yep. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a dog person. So, uh, you know, I always yeah. need to know. <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I love animals. Happy to get distracted and talk about them anytime. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with just a really quick like background on like what is neurodiversity and neurodiversity affirming like the paradigm that lens. I'm going to go through my slides pretty quick for that before jumping into the actual content. But um, there is a link to access these. I have them accessible to the public. So if you want to get on and read it more closely or explore any of the other resources, you're welcome to. So to start, just briefly, I want to talk about um, what neurodiversity is and why I think it's really important that we have this perspective if we're going to start to learn about different neurotypes and how they present and start to have a greater, deeper understanding of what we're seeing, not being the real truth, but looking underneath of it, right? So again, this is probably really small based on whatever screen you're on. You can scan the QR code if you want to go uh, learn more. But the main point here is just that neurodiversity is a way to discuss brain variants in general. Brain variance has always and forever been something that has been part of being a human. All brains are different. Even we know like the brains of identical twins operate differently. They're not going to be exactly identical in every single part. So I think whenever we're coming into something, we have to think about like, okay, like what we know about brains is this, but like also there's all these other variations and experiences. Um, neurodiversity and the idea that there's this infinite variation in human brains has led to the neurodiversity movement, which I think is what we talk about a lot more. And so the neurodiversity movement or this neurodiversity affirming lens of um, approaching therapy, approaching educating, approaching just existing in this world really affirms that anybody who has a brain outside of the norm is neurodivergent. And what the norm is, and I say that in quotations, is it's just defined by society. It's whatever society decides is normal and typical. That's the norm. And so we find that if you have a neurodivergent brain, your brain's outside of that, it doesn't mean you're ADHD or that you're autistic. And so when I see this being used as a synonym, I get pretty frustrated because I'm like, wait, there's more specificity that we need to like pay attention to this nuance. And so anybody, like you have OCD, that's neurodivergency. The neurodiversity affirming lens looks at disability itself as more of a social model instead of a medical model. So what that means is we're going back to looking at society, right? Well, if society just defines what's normal, then so society defines what's broken. Society defines what's disordered. Society defines how we quote unquote fix it. But like, why do we have to fix it? Why do we have to fix the brain? Maybe there's other things we could look at. Maybe there's other challenges. And that's not to say that medicine doesn't have a benefit for many people but also looking at these other parts, intersectionality, how do all their different identifiers show up? How do we think of things like, you know, there's this like stereotypical belief and hopefully it's less than it was 10 years ago, but that autistic people don't have empathy. That's not true. 
We know that now, but neurodiversity affirming lens is bringing this in, bringing these concepts into the work that we're doing and everything that we're doing when we're interacting with other people. So hopefully that sort of gives a little background into the kind of the philosophy that I bring into my work. It's definitely something where if you're interested, there's lots of great places to learn about it, but I'm gonna dive into talking about behavior and switching over to talking more about PDA. So to start, I think it's really important that if we're gonna talk about behavior, we have to be able to understand what behavior is. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that people talk about it, but behavior as it's defined, it's really just an observable and measurable response to something happening inside or something happening outside of us. What that means is the behavior is literally what we see happening. So if we're defining a behavior, we're like watching a young person. And I did mean to say like, most of the things I talk about will probably have to do with children and teens just because of my professional experience, but that doesn't mean that I don't know that there are, are autistic and PDAers who are adults, but that I don't think that it's important that we acknowledge that the children we talk about grow up into adults. So that all said, if you're in a classroom and you're watching Billy hit Tommy, hitting him for no reason, right? You're like, oh, Billy hit Tommy for no reason. That's not really the behavior. Like Billy walked over to Tommy silently, raised his arm, made a fist and struck Tommy with his fist and then walked back to his desk and sat back down or whatever. Like those are the behaviors. And so when we talk about a kid being oppositional or a person being oppositional, we talk about challenging behaviors overall, it's really easy to start to think that any behavior we see that looks like it's willfully defiant or looks like it's oppositional could be something that is that, and it's not because our interpretation of behavior is often really subjective. It doesn't mean that we're bad people, that that's what we think, or that we're putting this meaning into behavior, uh, but our brains are meaning making machines. So they're constantly looking and trying to classify and figure out why. So if you're that teacher that's like, oh, Billy got up and hit Tommy for no reason, you're not bad for putting meaning into that, but it's not gonna be helpful to figure out what's actually going on or to figure out why you might, or how you might be able to help that situation. Um, I put in here the diagnostic criteria for oppositional defiant disorder, which is in the DSM, because I think it's really important that when we're talking about subjectivity, that we talk about how subjective diagnostic criteria in general is, right? So we talk about like often losing attempt. I don't actually ever use this diagnosis, so I'd like to just like put that out there. In my early years when I was in like school social work and hospital social work and just kind of was doing what I thought that I should be doing. Um, I had used it, I think like once or twice, but now I'm like, absolutely not. Like, yeah. And, no and I appreciate that. I, I was, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the same as you were saying, and there, there's so many things out yeah. there that, you know, I mean, you know, for instance, uh, when I see things like emotionally disturbed, uh, you know, let, let's, let's say what <laughs> we're really looking at, we're looking at often trauma survivors and people that have been exposed. But, you know, when we put these labels on things, sometimes we, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan yeah. of some some of the, the diagnostic yeah, labels yeah. for sure. Absolutely. And I go back and forth, you know, overall on diagnostics and labels. And sometimes I'm really interested and into them and got to figure out the classification. Other times I'm like, um, F this, we should like have no labels and we should just think of like how we're showing up or what we need. But some of the labels I think are really dangerous, like this one. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I remember with my son when we were going through a lot of uh, kind of the diagnostic process and, you know, kind of my, my take on it was always really doesn't matter at the end of the day what what it what it's called, what it is. What matters is like, hey, what, what does he need to meet his needs and be successful? Like what are what are the barriers? You know, I love that you were talking about the social model because, you know, it's really about that that viewpoint. And let's not look through a deficit lens, but let's look at like what does this person need in their environment? What does this person need? to have access, you know, what does this person need to be successful? Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to in no, interrupt. Yeah, please. No, I like, that's great. I like the back and forth conversation. Um, but so, you know, if you're looking at a couple of these, like even like thinking someone's acting spiteful or vindictive, like it's really easy to look at different behaviors and say they're that, but unless you're asking that person and they're like, yes, I 100% did that out of spite. And they're really able to accurately assess their behavior. Like, how do you know? You don't really know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and how many times, I mean, how many times can I remember sitting in an IEP meet, team meeting and having having professionals talk about um, this behavior coming from my own child, but I've heard it from others as well, 
where you know they 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 attribute kind of this planning and this process and this manipulation and all these things that this child who they said has very little cap- capability of doing all these other things suddenly is is a, a mastermind of manipulation and uh, you know I remember hearing a, you know kind of staff talking about you know how my son did certain things and manipulated this and did that and thinking to myself like. I'm not even smart enough to come up with a plan that they're talking about. Like there, there's no way that my son came up with this really complicated plan to, to do this, but we do that, mm-hmm. right? We, we, we begin to look at things. And of course we look at them through the lens of a, you know, uh, more developed cortex and a more thoughtful, logical, rational point of view. And, and then we uh, forget that many of the, the children we're talking about, very young children often lack the developmental capacity that, an adult brain would have, right? Right. Yeah. Crazy. And yeah. and at their most stressed, they're right. creating those plans. Like no. Right. right. Like well, not when the cortex is have, yeah. going offline. Right. Right. Like and yeah. then they're like, now I will use this. You know, you That's see in like right. these FDAs, like it's for adult attention or it's for avoidance. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, maybe, but like, what does that mean? Like, why? Why do they want the adult attention? Right. And like, right. do they really? Or, yeah, or is it that maybe they need connection and support and co regulation, <laughs> right? Yeah, which can yeah. look like needing attention because right. it is kind of just in a different right. way. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. So again, I think that anytime we're talking about behavior, it's really important just to think about how subjective it is um, and to really look under that iceberg. And I know in her book, Beyond Behaviors, Mona Delahook talks about this a lot and looking at like the different needs that kids have and what they're showing up and what they're bringing with them. Um, this may not do all the awesome work that she's done any justice. This is just a little AI created iceberg, but I think it's important that we look at it, right? And we're looking at when I'm seeing a behavior that I would classify as oppositional, whatever that might mean or disrespectful or defiant, like here are all these other things that are likely part of what I am noticing, maybe not every single one every time, but maybe I could consider this list of things as a reason that someone might be acting that way. Um, I like this quote from Greg Santucci about like when we're looking at bad behavior, how do we know if it's a response to stress? Like just assume it is. Like if you're seeing something that you would classify as quote unquote bad, just assume that person's stressed. Your whole life with kids, teens, adults, it will probably be better if you just assume. Yeah. Doing the best you thing. know, right. I'll, I'll always assume a stress response because if you if you assume intention when there is not intention, but it's a stress response, and then you mm-hmm. then you follow your road to consequences and other things that you're doing, you right. may be causing harm, maybe causing trauma. You you you're not gonna you're not gonna go down the wrong road if you assume stress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I was in yoga teacher training for my 200 hour training, we read the four agreements. Interestingly enough, I had actually been given it by my therapist. I think she was like clearing off her bookshelves like 10 years before that. And I just was like, meh, I'm not going to read it. Put on a bookshelf, carry it around, move it. But when I did read it, it, one of the agreements is don't make assumptions. And I definitely still make them because I'm a human and that's what our brains do. But just thinking about those different agreements and like showing up and like how many assumptions we make as humans because our brains are just programmed to fill in gaps. It's really tough to step away from that. But like, how do we expect people to like show us who they are or what they're really experiencing if we don't step back from that? And it's hard, Mm -hmm. it's definitely tough. Uh, But there's just so many other things that even like our little tiniest youngest humans are dealing with now more than ever in our world that I think that we really, really, really lose the impact that we could have on helping them and supporting them by just assuming they're doing it to, be that way to be. Yeah, well, cu- curiosity goes a long way, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, be, being curious rather than, you know, um, you know, making, <laughs> making assumptions goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important too to when you think about these different things like being hungry or energy regulation, pressure, overwhelm, not getting enough sleep, so many not feeling safe. And knowing that like feeling safe doesn't have anything to do with if other people think you're safe or not. Like it's the feeling inside, like those types of things, they show up in so many different humans besides PDAers, right? Or besides ADHDers or autistic people where we seem to talk about demand avoidance a lot more. Like you could have a kid that shows up with an ODD diagnosis. They probably have a lot of trauma in their history, but you know, they could have that and they could be showing the challenges because they're also in that moment hungry like it can also it can be both Mm -hmm. right like it can be all the things 
And so I just think it's important that we're keeping that in mind, regardless of what we're learning or what we're talking about diagnostically. Sure. And, and not solely focused on the the thing that happened 10 seconds before the behavior, right? Because so often that's the case, you know, there, there's just this yeah. focus on, okay, let's look at, let's look at the ABCs, the antecedent behavior and the consequence. Okay. Right before that happened, this happened. There's yeah. so much more below the surface. And I, I mean, your, your iceberg is right, you're right on. And I mean, you know, kind of Chan Mona and I was actually, as you brought up the iceberg, thinking about Greg Santusi and his graphic about digging deeper, right? I mean, is it something mm-hmm. sensory? Is it something? Yeah. There's so yeah. much more. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, again, um, my perspective comes more from like children and teens and work with them, but adults, like we have this too. Like sometimes our reactions are awful and we might be dealing with some of this other stuff. And I say that as a therapist, as a step parent, like just as a human, like there are definitely times where I make assumptions about my teenager's behavior. And is it right? No. Do I go back and own it later? Absolutely. But maybe I was hungry or anxious or overwhelmed in those moments. And I can figure out how do I navigate that next time? Right? Uh, I'm just going to bring up a quick comment here because I see this and I I haven't read the whole thing, but it starts out in a way that that very much resonates with me. It says, I want, I want the word uh, behavior to be erased from the dictionary and replace it with action. Okay. Uh, Mm. Or use the term uh, only uh, in physics, like behavior uh, of a can of gas uh, or behavior of a beam of electron. Do not apply the term behavior to a human um, so, so I saw that, I don't know if you have any comments on it, but you know, I, I often feel that way too. Like, you know, we're, yeah. we're so focused on behavior and, and the other, the other thing I hate a lot is behavior management. Like yeah, it's all about managing someone else's state and their actions and their, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll give you a yeah. chance if you have any comment on that. No, yeah. I mean, I think you're right on with exactly that. I think we get hooked on these words. Like we get hooked on certain things and hooked on presentation. I think our society in general is hooked on outward and external appearances and achievements and productivity. And so we naturally look at behavior because that's what other people are going to see, right? I talk about this a little later on, or I will if I remember to bring it up, but a lot of what as a high masking human that I've done is kept my stuff together my shit together for lack of better words in every other environment except my house because my behavior was really important outside of those settings and i actually got a lot of positive feedback when i had positive behavior and you learn that really quick right and so behind closed doors that's a real struggle for me even as an adult but we drill into kids drill into them You have to have appropriate behavior. You have to have kind behavior, respectful behavior. It gets confusing. How do they know Mm -hmm. who they are or what they need to work on? So, yeah, that's an injustice. And and, and all that, you know, kind of all all that pressure uh, leading to, you know, masking and and so many other things um, is so much pressure that, I mean, you know, you, you get out of that environment and it's like, I mean, you, you melt. I mean, it just, it's just so much pressure on, on people. Yeah, absolutely. There's people my whole entire life who would never believe the meltdowns that I've had behind closed doors because of how clenched into my human body that I felt that I needed to stay Mm. to be appropriately behaved in different situations, you know? And there's plenty of other kids who don't also have access to therapy and access to these other things that help us heal from it. And those are the ones who I get most concerned about, not people like me who have access to support, who've had it mm-hmm. forever, mm-hmm. and they get lost. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, maybe one day we'll think about it differently as a whole in a society. Mm-hmm. But for now, we're doing what we can. There's a lot of work to be done, but it, but it, yeah. it just it, it starts by keeping going, right, even when things are really tough. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, all right. So with all that, I can dive into PDA unless you had other questions or comments. No, no, go. And, and you don't oh, have to behave yeah. here. So <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. Yeah. It's good to know. All right. So I'm going to start just diving right into talking a little bit about what PDA is. Um, you'll notice that at the top, I have a couple other words put up there. And that's because I have heard PDA talked about as pathological demand avoidance as like the most common way that I hear it. But I also hear that word pathological switched out with persistent or with pervasive. And I think a lot of that has to do, and I'm really only talking from my own perspective here, but like pathological as a word, I understand what it means that like it happens in all these different places. It's not really stopping. It's this pattern. It just keeps going, even if the person doesn't want it to. 
but I think it just has a negative connotation to it sometimes. Um, so I think, you know, we see it switched out and I wouldn't want to do some kind of intro webinar without making sure that you knew there's other alternatives. But again, I always defer back to like, how do you want to refer to it? Mm -hmm. Like if you're talking to like a big group, probably you want to refer to like the way people mostly agree on or will understand. But if for somebody who identifies as PDA, they think of it as a pervasive drive for autonomy, then like, great, let's talk about what that looks like for you. Um, demand as a word will break down and talk about it too but we also see like avoidance is switched out sometimes for autonomy or for anxiety and i think again it comes back to like meaning what meaning people derive from it what meaning they attach to and i don't think there's really a right or wrong at least from my perspective i will say though making this presentation and putting all of these words onto slides was really difficult for me um, I think that for as much hard work as we are doing to get the word out and talk about these things, we are also like making it really hard to teach about because I think, and I don't, again, this is my perspective, but I think there's like this fear of, for me at least, getting it wrong mm -hmm. and not just wrong for the people who I want to learn about it, who like hopefully they're having a positive takeaway, they're getting at least something out of it, but wrong for the people who think they have expertise in it. And it's one of the reasons that I don't talk as much as like I probably would like to about things like this, besides that I'm like, who needs one more white lady talking about it? But like, I, it's, it's scary to be like, hey, this is my understanding of a topic that is controversial right now that people think is just like made up crap, that other people are like, if I had known about this, it would have changed mm -hmm. my whole life, right? Like, mm -hmm. on either sides, and people get really stressed. So again, I'm just one person. This is my understanding and take from the research. Um, and if you do have feedback, I'd love to hear it sometime maybe over email or we could chat, but I don't know. It was really stressful to put this all down into words. Mm -hmm. Tried to give mm -hmm. as many options. Mm -hmm. But anyways, PDA, pathological demand avoidance is a profile on the autism spectrum that we have been researching and learning about until or since like the 1980s. So what I see is Professor Elizabeth Newsom is the one who is most notably uh, credited with identifying this and starting to talk about this pattern of atypical autism in quotes that she started to notice in the work that she was doing. So uh, PDAers, a lot of times what we are talking about when we're talking about them and identifying them it does go back to a little bit of talking about behavior and what we see, but we know that PDA is like a deeply visceral internal experience that sometimes looking at just behavior or what we see or presentations or characteristics, it just doesn't give it justice. It's really hard to put into words how tough things are sometimes. And I think that trying to explain to someone how demands, which again, we'll talk about a little bit, how your body and your brain can resist demands so frequently and it just doesn't get better or you just can't do it it can get really hard to explain it and it's really nuanced but when we talk about pda as like this is what we're looking for we're we're talking about characteristics of humans who are resisting what we would call ordinary demands of life and ordinary demand could be a request made of you and again we'll dive into this in a little bit but it could also be your body being like, I have to go to the bathroom or it's time to eat food right now. Those are also ordinary demands of life that we see patterns of really struggling to navigate those. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about that I have in my notes that I did want to point out is that PDA isn't its own diagnosis. It's actually not recognized really in the United States growing in like knowing about it, but it's not recognized in the sense of some kind of diagnosis that lives in the DSM. So we do talk about it just under an autism subtype. And I know there's controversy on that. And some people think it's separate. Some people think it's the same. Um, I will talk about it as part of the autism spectrum in this presentation, just because that's how I know it to be based on the research. Um, so again, category, the big key characteristic here is this resistance to ordinary demands of life as it's explained. But we're talking about a resistance that comes up in a lot of ways that seems like it's social strategies. That's, that's the words that I hear so much as these social strategies of resisting or avoiding demands. A social strategy could look like some kind of distraction. I often see the word manipulation put up into there. I put it into this presentation because it's so common to see that. 
not manipulation in the sense of this like hostile, like, oh, I'm gonna get you to do what I want and I'm so quote unquote bad, but like I need to understand this situation and get out of it type of manipulation, getting needs met. Um, something else that we notice with PDAers is intense mood swings, like often very quick, up and downs all day, right? Very, very intense internal nervous system regulation struggles are leading to external presentations of intense mood swings. Um, there's definitely people who internalize more than externalize with PDA. And so sometimes you're not seeing those as much on the outside, but they're still happening on the inside. Again, recognizing that PDA is part of autism, we also have to recognize that there can be sensory processing differences that are contributing to some of what we're seeing in this intense mood swings or mood lability as we talk about it sometimes as professionals. Um, a lot of PDAers talk about meltdowns. And I think we, you know, we see it in lots of different neurotypes and lots of different humans have meltdowns, but PDAers and meltdowns we see happening a lot as related to some type of demand. And again, it can be an external demand, an internal demand. It's not necessarily something that if you're just watching for behavior, you're going to understand from the outside. But once a meltdown happens, you may see different behaviors that are indicative of like, this is too much for that person. This is way too much for their nervous system because we're seeing them start to have quote unquote observable behavior that looks different types of ways and is noting to us like that's just way too much. PDAers often have a high need for control as described as like something that people could see or observe. As somebody who, like I said, I do align with an experience that I think is very similar or exactly the same as a PDA or um, I definitely have a high need for control, but only when it intersects me. So like if it doesn't intersect my stuff, like I don't necessarily need to control you like or the situation. But like if we are intersecting in some kind of way that I have to learn to like navigate whatever you're bringing into it, then like I do have a really intense anxiety response to that. Again, when we're talking about behavior and what we can see, if you're seeing someone with a high need for control, I think you also have to consider other things that could be going on. Sometimes we develop a high need for control or intense anxiety or these like really quick trigger automatic stress responses because of trauma, right? And so it's important that we think of that. When we talk about PDA and autistic people, trauma is something that happens a lot. Not just like big T trauma or little T trauma from existing in the world, but also trauma from being autistic, trauma from showing up in ways where a lot of times PDA or specifically, they're not identified as autistic really young, but they're definitely identified as having inappropriate behavior a lot as they're growing up. And they don't have a reason for it, right? We're not given a reason of like, oh, well, like you're struggling to quote unquote regulate your behavior or have appropriate behavior at school because your brain processes this way. No, most of the time you're labeled as oppositional or you're maybe fawning and you're overly compliant or you're just like, nobody knows why you're acting this way. Why can't you just do it? Why can't you just get it together? Why are you shouting at home all the time? Why are you shouting at your teacher? Why aren't you going to school? And we're forgetting that there's other things going on too. Um, you you yeah, know, that, that, that point that you were making a second ago, um, you know, I, one of the things I, I tend to talk about a lot in, in presentations is kind of that intersection between, um, you know, uh, disability, neurodivergence, trauma, um, and, and just the, you know, I mean, I, I think that so many people tend to miss this, but I think just being neurodivergent in a neurotypical world can be traumatizing, right? Um, in, in so many ways. And, and, you know, when you dive into, um, you know, when you begin to dive into, um, you know, disability, I mean, you know, even just kind of the scenario of being non-speaking uh, autistic in a world that doesn't understand your wants and needs. I mean, the, the, the trauma and the stress and the, you know, anxiety from that, um, you know, and then on top of that, we've got very real systemic trauma that happens to a lot of children. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, we our, our work here is, is centered around that in terms of things like restraint seclusion. But of course, there's there's other things and, and systems of care, you know, absolutely can be uh, systems that can lead to trauma. Um, so anyway, I just I'm just thinking yeah. about what you were saying there. And it's, just, you know, it's such a, a, I think, an important point. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, when we talk about trauma in general, or like, you know, generational trauma, systemic trauma, these different things, like a lot of autistic humans are being raised by humans that don't know that they're autistic. Mm -hmm. And so these are people who have maybe navigated the world in a way that they don't seem to have any struggles, but they might seem really rigid, or they might yell for no reason or different things. And they may not even understand themselves. And then they're bringing a tiny human into the world. And then there may be like almost immediate like caregiver trauma, not intentional, not on purpose, but because one human brings their self into the parenting relationship, right? And then it just gets passed on. And so I think that's what I talk about, like when I talk about like, okay, well, like this is something I really align with and, right? Like, and if there's stuff that happens really early on in our life, like we may never know and do we need to? Right. Like if yeah. this is a neuro, if it's a nervous system experience, like do we need to know for a hundred percent certain? I don't. Yeah. Know. What, one of the things I've seen in, in people that I that I know um, uh, time and time again, and I'm sure that in your professional experience that you've seen this, is um, um, adults that have learned about their own neurodivergence through the journey of their children and um, have received late diagnoses <laughs> along the lines of you know autistic or. A PDA or yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, the, what you were saying, I, I'm sure yeah. resonates with a lot of, a lot of people in our community. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll just dive back here. Cause I would definitely get on a tangent about late diagnosis and maybe we could save that for another time. Um, but along with having this like really intense nervous system experience of needing to feel like there's autonomy in choices that we're making or control of situations that we're in that drives the entire PDA experience. Um, we also see other certain characteristics within this profile that seem to be patterns, right? Special interests tending to be person focused, bordering on a little bit obsessional, sometimes beyond bordering. Um, that's definitely something that can happen. I relate to that. I tended to be more obsessed with like musicians when I was growing up, but you know, there's certain musicians that like I could tell you every single thing about them. I was, it was like very into it. And you know, if that was a human instead of like a celebrity, that could be something where navigating that can be tough. It can be really tough when there's somebody that like hooks interest and maybe that other person isn't interested in being your friend or you're just interested in learning about them. You want to know about them. So you're asking lots of questions to them. You don't understand why they think you're weird, right? Because of the social nuances that come with being neurodivergent in a neurotypical world, they also exist for PDAers because they're also autistic, right? So this nuance of the, the world of social interactions is something that PDAers are trying to figure out too and bringing with them into the different experiences. So we add in if they're not identified as autistic, they don't know. Again, it goes back to this like cycle that creates shame and struggles. Um, so going along with that, like we talk about masking for PDAers, I have a whole slide on masking. So we'll get to that, but just showing up and um, just how these different social struggles can lead to sometimes feeling like, like, who am I, right? Like, I've presented in so many different ways in so many situations. So many people think my behavior is this way or my behavior is that way or I'm this way or I'm that way. I can even show up and be those ways, but like, who am I really? And navigating the world without that internal compass can be really overwhelming. And that's where there's risks of really dangerous things that can happen because adults around them have identified that like they're wrong or they need to change or be different but aren't looking below it to like well why isn't this working for you why isn't this something that you know is making you feel good like let's talk about it so we just focus on that behavior and then we just learn to conform um they might seem comfortable pretending role playing being in fantasy so that i think leads to being missed as being autistic because we have this stereotypical understanding that autistic people aren't doing those things um, we know that PDAers are really not responsive to conventional teaching, parenting, compliance-driven methods, behavioral approaches. Like these things are not working, but we just keep like doubling down. We're like, yes, do it. No. Well, and, and, and of course, <laughs> you know, our, our schools are compliance-driven demand mm -hmm. factories, right? 
Uh, I mean, you, you, you probably couldn't ask for a more inhospitable environment for many of yeah. our kids. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of, I mean, the, the focus on compliance, uh, just to me, it's, it's totally the wrong focus for our schools. And, and it's like, we, we need to take a real hard look and step back from that. You know, I mean, yes, we need to be able yeah. to understand like how to get along and how to work together. And, and that there are, are situations where we have to have, you know, certain rules and boundaries. Sure. But the, the, the focus on compliance is so strong. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, I feel like it's getting more strong as time goes on. You know, I worked as a school social worker in a non-public school for three years. Um, I left in January 2016, so I started in 2013. And um, yes, yeah, so there was a huge push for compliance there. And in just the three years that I was there, we went from being more creative and thoughtful in our approaches, like having just like a different mindset to like, dealing with behavior it was behavior 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 and it right, right. like it just lead, it pushes people out that can make a difference kids get lost it's so harmful and, and i don't and know the, what's com the, right the, the compliance <laughs> squashes the creativity and thoughtfulness on the other side as well so so yeah. you know i mean you know i think the compliance approach is absolutely squashing like natural curiosity and and all the things that underlie learning for intrinsic reasons right um, yeah. Anyway, we could, we could yeah. probably do a whole other show on that. I know. Too. I yeah. gotta... I'm going to be quiet because I know you have a lot to cover. So I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll be quiet for a while. That's okay. Um, so as I've mentioned several times, I've decided here just to really underscore like PDAers are, are autistic. Like they are, from what I have learned and understood, they are autistic. I also think a lot, and I know in research it says it, I think a lot of times they're also ADHD. I have my own thoughts about PDA, autism, and ADHD, and how they all relate together. And for the sake of this understanding, PDAers are autistic. Autism spectrum, PDA, it's not, you're just a little bit autistic or you're a lot of bit autistic. Like, that's cute. No, that's not what it is. It's this dynamic circle that's always shifting and has all these different parts to it. And so to truly understand PDA, you do have to really understand autism and what it really is and what it is to be autistic. And so I think that's something that, you know, I wanted to put in here as resources that you guys can learn about it if you want. I don't think I have enough time to talk about all of that. But there's a whole realm of experiences that we have when we're autistic that are really important to understand when you are interacting with PDAers and to understand that a lot of times it's under the surface. You're not maybe seeing it as stereotypically presenting as you might in other things. So I wanted to take some time to focus on understanding demands because even though I don't know a better word for demands and I wish I did so then I could tell everyone, I just really wish there was a different way to talk about them in the sense of, I think that we, the nuance gets lost. I work with kids and teens. I do a lot of parent consultation and a lot of times it's something that because it's new and I think it's something that when we're really looking for answers, we can start to find and make meaning in different ways. Sometimes I get really frustrated trying to navigate conversations of, well, they won't listen when I tell them what to do. Okay, well, like, can we talk about what else is going on? But I want them just to listen. Like, I want them to follow my directions. Why aren't they following my directions? Well, let's talk about what else is going on. And sometimes I think we forget that demands are not just people telling us what to do or asking us to do things. They come from inside. Sometimes they just exist. They're just implied. They're just there. Sometimes just having a human in the same house as me makes it difficult to regulate. Because what if they want my attention? What if they come upstairs and ask me a question? What if, you know, something else happens? And it's not just like, oh, an anxiety piece. It's bigger than that. There's this like pull on the nervous system, just knowing that there's a presence. So when we think about demands and we talk about demands, like again, there's this external like rules, laws, um, written instructions, like those, I think external demands are really easy to learn about. And so I probably not talk about them so much, but internal demands, they come from a place of like what you have to do to take care of your body, what you want as a person, what you might need as a person the nervous system response that comes with having a PDA nervous system being a PDA is going to make it difficult. It's going to make it extremely tough to act on whatever you need to act on to address those demands. So I put up 
um, this is a graphic from PDA Society, but I put up some little things on the side just to remind myself to talk a little bit about some of the demands that I didn't know could be related to PDA until I started learning about it. So one of them is that my mom, bless her soul, I just have all, since I can remember, just interchanged mom and her first name. Like, it, I don't know why. Like, I just, it doesn't, like, people called her bunny. And so I also would call her bunny. And sometimes I would call her mom. And sometimes I would call her her given name of Roberta. And like, it, and I did it the other day too. I, I go grocery shopping with my mom or I wouldn't go. And she's like one of the only humans who will just tolerate my crankiness. And so like on Mondays, we go to the grocery store. She comes by, we go together. And sometimes I'm really not nice and happy to go to the grocery store. And sometimes I bail on going to the grocery store, but I wouldn't go if there wasn't someone to make me. I used to drive to the grocery store parking lot and be like, nope, and leave. And so at some point I started grocery shopping with her. But anyways, like we're in the middle of the grocery store. I'm like, mom, Roberta, Roberta. And I'm thinking like, I'm an adult now, but like, geez, I, was I doing this when I was younger? Maybe. Like to a lot of people, that's not following the rules. It's your mom. We're supposed to call her mom. It's rude if you don't. And probably at some point she also thought I was rude. And now she just tolerates it. Well, you know, my son <laughs> used to and, and still does sometimes call me big guy. You know, hey, big guy. Oh, jeez. You know? <laughs> I could see uh, how that would be tough at yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, <laughs> yeah well, you know, and, and but you know, at the end of the day, uh, some rules probably don't need to be <laughs> rules, and uh, you know that that's that's a, a, I think an, a bigger issue. But you know, yeah. sometimes we have things in place, and they've always been in place that way. But it doesn't mean that they need to be in place that way, right? Right, or we just don't talk about it either. Like, why? Okay, well, just ex like I explain to my clients that I work with, like sometimes things are just rules because everybody says they are. I don't know. I don't know why it is a thing, but like, do you, is it something you would like to do or not? Because like, let's talk about that. And sometimes I think we just forget to talk about the why. Um, another thing that I think we forget about demand avoidance is it's not always things we don't want to do. Uh, it can be things that we are die hard passionate about, things that we want to do really, really badly. Um, I have created an entire curriculum for 95 hour kids yoga teacher training. It is approved by the Yoga Alliance. I pay my dues and renew it every single year. I don't do anything with it right now. And that's, I I use busyness as an excuse a lot. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. But the truth is like, sometimes I just can't. Like I just, I don't, I can't. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But sometimes we see, PDAers who are racking up achievements, productivity, certifications, they're excelling in school and they still have a nervous system disability. They're still struggling with these things. And sometimes we just don't know. And then that kid has one final moment that takes them too far and they tell their teacher to go fuck themselves and that's it. They're a behavioral classification now. We're certainly happy to figure out what's going on from our perspective of that and address that and give them a consequence, right? Hey, we just had a, a question oh. pop up that I yeah. want to uh, throw at you real quick. Uh, and this question is, is PD, uh, PDA and ODD uh, the same thing? Mm. So no, um, I, ODD is just a classification of behavior. Like if we go back and look at the like criteria, it's just a list of things you can see other people do. It doesn't have anything to do with, um, etiology. I think a lot of PDAers get misidentified as ODD. Mm -hmm. If they're more externalizing, I think it can definitely happen. Um, and I think if they aren't like re like holding it in at school, it's even more likely. But when we look at like what people who think of ODD as valid and legitimate and study it say, like oftentimes we know it has to do more with like uh, family structure, environment, trauma. Trauma is really the big piece there. Um, but it's just behavior classification. PDA, when we talk about it and why I think it's so important that we talk about it, it's recognizing that it's a nervous system disability. Whereas ODD is a classification of behavior and that could come for a variety of different reasons. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say about demands again, just kind of to highlight that it's not always things that like just other people want us to do. Um, sleep is a huge demand for me that I didn't even know was an issue until like other people 
my step someone would be like, why do you hate sleeping so much? I'm like, I don't know, I'll just waste my time. Why do I have to sleep? There's so many other things you could do instead of sleep. And since I was young, I would, I would get in trouble. I'd be falling asleep on the couch. My mom would be like, you're falling asleep on the couch, go to bed. And I would have a full on meltdown. I'm not asleep. Like you are, you just missed 30 minutes of the movie, go to bed. I'm not. And I'm, do I do that to that extent at home? I won't confirm or deny, but like I still, will lie that I'm not sleeping when I've missed a whole episode of the show. So you just never know how it's going to show up. Uh, that being said, not all demand avoidance is PDA driven demand avoidance. So demand avoidance, when we think of it in terms of PDA, is an automatic, unintentional nervous system response to anxiety and or loss of autonomy, or someone else might say loss of control automatic unintentional not oh i don't want to do that thing my teacher told me and now i'm going to create a plan for how i'm not going to while i am perfectly calm and regulated mm -hmm. right no doesn't mean every time there's demand avoidance there's a meltdown or a shutdown right there may be some kind of in between that's not this like i don't want to do it so i'm not that is I don't want to do it, so I'm not. Like, and definitely there are times where we all decide we're not going to do something because we don't want to do it. And sometimes it's something maybe we quote unquote should, but PDA demand avoidance, PDA or's experience of demand avoidance is that this is showing up in areas that are things they want, things they wish they could comply with. Things would be a lot easier to just like blend into the system and be like, oh, the boss says that's what we should do. Okay. Let's do it because they're the boss. And for a lot of people, that would feel a lot simpler. And if your nervous system isn't giving you this like understanding that you have to comply with all social hierarchies in quotes again, right? Like it's going to be harder to convince a PDA or that you should respect this hierarchy because you said so, because they're going to have this automatic, unintentional nervous system response to loss of autonomy that comes with social hierarchies. When we're looking at demand avoidance and we're looking at um, what we might be able to see, and again, we have to remember that internalized PDA you're not gonna be able to see, but if we're looking at what we're gonna be able to see, you might see somebody ignoring, walking away. You might see them starting to like boss people around, starting to negotiate, eloping, getting out of there, lots of school absences we might want to look at nervous system disabilities and how that's impacting people that aren't in school. Um, PDAers demand avoidance can also be getting silly. It can be switching the topic of conversation. It can also be fawning and just like being super overly agreeable, even though inside you feel like you're dying. So there's all different ways that PDA can show up. And again, it goes back to why we have to be so curious. And I'm not giving any of this the time that it needs because it is so nuanced. So again, I'll just say like, please go do your own learning about things like this, learn from a variety of resources um, and keep learning about it. One of the common things I hear when we start to talk about PDA and arguments about like, is it PDA, is it not? Is it PDA just like this made up thing? Isn't it giving excuses to kids? But everyone avoids sometimes, right? And we hear this with all kinds of different disabilities right mm -hmm. like everyone forgets where their keys are sometimes we're all a little adhd no 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 like you have never searched for your keys almost every day of your life like nope same with demand avoidance like everybody does avoid things sometimes yes and unless you've really experienced like not being able to do things that are so important to you or continuing to let down others around you because they just don't understand why you just can't do it I don't know that you can really identify like if this is a real thing or not. Like it is so real to the people who do experience it. And I don't know why we argue with like, oh, well, because this happens to everybody, it can't be a disability for you. Okay. So again, like people avoid for lots of different reasons. They avoid because they're stressed, they're burnt out, they're bored, they don't know how to do it, they have interactions from their physical needs, trauma that they've experienced. There's just not enough time. They don't understand. Or maybe they just don't want to do it. It doesn't always mean that they're a PDA-er. It doesn't always mean 
that that's something we should explore. But if we're not curious about it, we're not wondering, we might miss something. So sometimes we see, again, because PDAers are autistic, that sometimes even if not PDA, that's getting in the way in those moments, right? It might be something like autistic inertia, where what we know about autistic brains is like, as they start a task or something they're interested in, and time goes on in that task, it gets harder and harder to disengage. It is really easy for me to lose my shit if I'm working on something and someone comes and interrupts me, especially if I'm like overwhelmed. This presentation, again, I can't say like I was, I don't know how many times I was like, I'm gonna write you guys an email. I'm, I can't do it, I can't finish it. Like up until probably like 3.06 PM. And I was like, it's too late, like you can't. Like this was really tough. And that's not all because of PDA, right? Like there's also a lot of executive dysfunction that there is to push through putting together a presentation. You know, there's different things I think we always have to be aware of when we're being curious, like considering different options. One of the other things, and I know I wanna be mindful of time, so tell me to speed up if I need to. Um, but one of the other things that I think is really important is to go back to this idea that PDAers are really often missed if we're looking for what we thought autism was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? There's so much there and there's so much masking that we know goes on with PDAers in general, so much chameleoning, being able to show up in situations and every part of your being is like, hey, you have to fit in and maybe you are subconsciously doing it or maybe you're unconsciously doing it, but you're not showing up as your real self. And we get so many different messages about this. And so I threw on a couple memes for just kind of a greater understanding. But when we look at people and we're like, but they don't seem autistic. They're just being defiant. They're not autistic. They are fine. What do you mean? They just don't want to do it. We're really, again, not giving like any kind of possibility to the fact that maybe there's something going on that we don't understand. We know that masking is like really something that can impact quality of life, mental health. And we know that it's something that when it's done in a way that like, so there's masking in general, I guess I should have started with that. Like masking is when we're showing up, not as ourselves. Oftentimes we talk of it in like, neurodivergent people masking to become neurotypical seeming humans, right? I used to drink a lot, a lot. And I started drinking way before I would want anybody to start drinking because it made me feel like I could fit in. I felt like I could be that like normal human. That's what you're supposed to do is like party and have fun. And so that was something that I would do. I used to pretend to be interested in things that I had no interest in. I smile a lot when I'm talking to other people that I'm not super comfortable with. If you know me in real life, no. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I smile and I laugh. I'm not like miserable, but like I often am just sitting there with like a dead face. Like I'm just like, like doing whatever I'm doing. That's all masking, right? Yeah. Changing the tone of our voice, not moving so much. I used to crack the pens off of my, or the like tips off my pen all the time. I think about it now. How did I sit in meetings? I'm constantly moving all day now. I used to sit so rigidly in meetings. I taught myself about eye contact. I didn't know, but I remember in probably middle school looking up, like, because I had heard if you look to the left, you're lying. And I knew that I didn't look at people in the eye as much as I should, quote unquote, should. should and right. so I looked up and I studied, like, how many, how many times are you supposed to look at someone when you're talking to them? And I think it's like 70% of the time or something like that, if we're like, whatever, who makes that up? But so we see this a lot and a lot in PDAers because we're missing them. We're classifying them differently. Right. But, but there's a tremendous cost to all of that, right? There's a oh tremendous God, cost yeah. to all of the masking, to the forced eye contact, to all of these things. There's a yeah. tremendous cost you know, on, 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 and not only kind of the form of stress, but ultimately that stress then leading to nervous system dysregulation. So, you know, the, the very things that, you know, people are sometimes doing to, you know, kind of 
fit in in the neurotypical world. And again, I, I think we need to change expectations rather than, mm. you know, putting people through the stress and trauma that the masking goes through. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a tremendous cost, isn't it? Yeah. If I'm being really honest, I don't feel like I fit in in any social group or dynamic. And when I found out that I was autistic, it was almost presented as this, like, now you found your people. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I wish. I absolutely 100% wish. And it's just not true because I am 35 holding 32, 33 years of knowing something wasn't just right, right? Like there's something, like I really wanted to be a cool kid, but I wasn't. <laughs> like, I wasn't. And I knew that I didn't want to be a nerdy kid because they weren't the cool kids. I love space. I love space so much. And I didn't pay attention to it for years. I mm. like programming. I've programmed like a custom GPT. I know nobody that I can talk to about it, really, besides my husband, because he's really into AI. But like, it's things that we don't think about. We don't think about it. Like, oh, these people, they look like they're achieving so much. They're so happy. They're no way. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. Like all we had to do was teach it a little bit different. Like I don't think we have to go burn down. I mean, there are some systems I think we need to really get rid of, but we can start to make small changes. You just teach it as like there's not a right way or a wrong way. There's just two ways or three ways or a hundred ways, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. just your way might not work for somebody else, and that's mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, absolutely. There's a mental health cost. There's substance use risk. Right? right. There's just, right. there's so much that we know when you feel like you don't belong or you think there's something wrong. So, so I want to just pop in with a question here yeah. real quick. Um, and, uh, I know we're, we're, we're kind of in the time frame that we had talked about. Yeah. And if you're, you're okay going f still for a few more minutes, we'll go for a few more minutes. Yeah. Uh, I have th this is great. I only have okay. Okay. Slides. So the, the question here is, uh, how can we respond to professionals that think we should be teaching kids to overcome the characteristics of PDA? Uh, I, uh, mm. I'm often told that my son, will have to learn to accept the demands of life because they will always have demands in life. Oh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, before I go too much, I'll let, I'll let you take that. Uh, and this is where like, I think my hesitancy came in of like, am I gonna sound like I'm like wishy-washy or like what? But like, yeah, you're right. I mean, there are demands of life. There's demands to existing, right? Like we have to keep right. our bodies moving and going. Like I can't never sleep just because I don't like it. Um, but I think there's a way to teach kids to work with their bodies and to work with their nervous systems and to teach adults that like, if there is something that they're doing, that's a big demand and you want them to do it and they want to do it. Cause like, let's assess whose demand, whose thing is it that we're talking yeah, about right, that they need right. to do, but teach them how to navigate it. Yeah. There's going to be times where you absolutely cannot do the thing that you want you to you want to do or someone else is expecting something of you and you cannot do it. And this is how we can make it not shameful and we can learn to navigate our brains. Right, right. And, and it seems to me, I mean, there are I mean, you, you hear this kind of logic in a lot of things. Um, so so I think about hearing professionals say things, you know, um, you know, I had a son that, um, you know, kind of. Um, could get overstimulated in an environment that was really loud or, you know, um, that had a lot going on, a cafeteria, a, a school gym, all those kinds of environments. And you'd hear this, well, well, one day they're, they're going to need to be able to go to the grocery store. And, you know, I mean, you know, this, this kind of logic, mm -hmm. right. And, and today we have more and more options. I mean, you, you mentioned the grocery store and I was thinking, you know, yeah. uh, I, I now have a service that I can actually have groceries like delivered to my house and, you know, yeah. I don't have to go to the grocery store. Mm. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, 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 I mean, some of this is about, you know, kind of back to the, yeah. the medical model, like how do we evolve as a society as well and support yeah. more, more diversity in, in, in people and not, you know, kind of forcing uh, people. And I think this idea that, um, yeah, we often have to assess the demands that, you know, as adults, assess the demands mm -hmm. that we're making and, and why we're making them because sometimes a change, well, often the change that needs to happen is not one in the, the child that we're working with, but, you know, is this really a demand that we need and do we need this demand now, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'd say that's where the change needs to happen. It's kind of, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great question though. Yeah. We don't know where the world's even going to be in like five, 10 years. Like there's so much changing and I feel like we're so. Uh, tw 2024 of... scares the hell out of me. So you know, <laughs> when you say that, I don't know where I'm going to be in a year <laughs> based on what's happening right, right. these days. Absolutely. 
But I think that we're holding on to this like old idea and this old view because it's it seems safe, right? Like it's right, all we've right. ever been taught. We were sold this lie, right? Like right. go to school, get your college degree. You can have a happy life too. Okay. Right, right, like, right. and so I think we don't know what to do as adults. And sometimes considering another option of like, maybe we need to look at the demands or maybe we need to look at ourselves instead of these kids and compliance. It's hard. Right. Right. But it's necessary. Right. Right. But, um, but, you know, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the quote I always, always, you know, try to try to abide by is that, that my Angela quote, you know, uh, do the best you can until you know better and you know, better do better. Mm -hmm. We're at a point on a lot of these <laughs> things where we absolutely know better and we're not doing better. So, yeah. I mean, you know, th th there's, there's a lot of progress to be made, but you know, it's, it's nothing's perfect. Right. So we've got to keep, absolutely. you know, yeah. All right. I'm going to let you. Yeah. You, no, you it's okay. Going. Yep. I just put this up while we were talking. I feel like I touched on a lot of this already. And so I don't really feel like I need to like read it straight through, but I do think it's really important to go back to just acknowledging that like when we're looking at behavior and when we're thinking about like, could it be this or could it be that like a meltdown can look really similar to someone just being nasty, just to be nasty mm -hmm. or just being rude, just being defiant, just, just escaping They're fleeing. Right, like those types of things. And I said that in the way I did because like that is something that I hear sometimes from schools. Like they're fleeing the classroom, they're eloping from the classroom because they don't want to do the work. Like maybe it's something else. Right, right. And and we also need to worry about the one the people that we are not seeing melt. The ones who put their heads down and right. don't do anything. We need to worry about them too. I used to cut holes in my hoodies, bring my walkman, string my headphones up and put my music on because I couldn't regulate at school. I couldn't handle it, but I was quiet when I did that. I wasn't mouthing off yep, at the teachers yep, then. Yep. So it's easy to just ignore, right? Like we need to remember that there's more than what we see. Right. When we think about kind of that, that stress response and that kind of fight flight, fr you know, freeze kind of response, you know, it, it's the kids that often, I mean, you know, kids that have the, the big response, the, and, and I'm not, I'm sorry to use the, beha the behavior word here, but the, the big behaviors, right? So the yeah. kids that are having kind of that big behavior, um, they, for better, or for worse, get attention. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's better, but a lot of times it's worse. Um, but the kids that are in shutdown, you know, the other side of the nervous system. So we've got the sympathetic response, right? That fight or flight response, you know, leading, leading to these big behaviors. Um, these are kids that at least are being seen in terms of like, oh, these are kids that need help. The kids that are on the other side, the parasympathetic side and shutting down they're, they're you know, they, I mean, just as you described, these are kids that often aren't getting any help at all because they're not causing a disruption. Um, they're kind of sliding below the radar and you know, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, we've got some huge, uh, I think mental health concerns and issues that we're facing these days, you know, not only kids, but adults as well, but you know, kind of post pandemic, it's a really tough time right now. It's a really tough time to be a, a teenager yeah. or a high schooler or whatever you might be. And the, you know, a lot of the kids are in that kind of shutdown, that parasympathetic, you know, still like it's a stress mm -hmm. response. Um, yeah, it's a scary place. Absolutely. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be a teenager right now. Hey, I've got to, I've got to call this out real quick yeah. because, um, um, you know, I've, I've told you that we have kind of an international <clears throat> audience and we've got somebody here from Puerto Rico, wow. but in a first ever, this is first ever, we've got somebody from Fiji. So, you know, I don't know that we've ever had somebody that's at least has said hello from Fiji. So I just had to call that out. And, uh, Very cool. you, you know, it makes me kind of wish right now that, that I, that I was in Fiji, but you know, <laughs> me too. <laughs> all right, let, yeah. let me let, let you continue on. Cause I know we've got to, yeah. got to wrap up here shortly. Absolutely. Yep. And I'm gonna, you know, I think we talked about a lot of this. I think yeah. the only other thing that I really want to say about like PDA is like, sometimes you don't see it in the places you think. And so we have to believe parents. Right. Like I, I, we just have to like if they say like my kid is shutting down at home every day when they come home from school it's not always a parent problem it doesn't mean it's a teacher problem per se but like maybe it's just like school and their nervous system let's talk about it let's be curious yeah absolutely yeah. Oh, i did want to ask you and, and also from india so look at this wow. um i did want to ask you in terms of diagnostics well and of course yeah. you know here in the u.s pda is still not recognized but yeah we're, we're seeing more and more people i mean i'm i'm you know, I'm also, I think, as you know, I'm, I'm on the board of PDA North America, which is a, a great organization. Uh, I know that they have been growing. They've got a, a conference coming up here uh, in March. Uh, they're doing some amazing work. We're, we're, though, even at the Alliance, hearing more and more parents that are contacting us um, that are recognizing PDA in their children. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We're actually seeing schools that are recognizing PDA. We're also seeing schools wow. that are like, that doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> stop bothering us. Um, but we are seeing that. But in terms of, you know, I mean, I, I know just kind of looking at autism in general, there are troubling things in terms of diagnostics. Uh, you know, for example, even kind of ra along racial lines that, you know, two kids presenting the same way, uh, black or brown child is uh, given an a, a emotional disturbance yeah. uh, label and, and uh, you know, white child presenting the same is, is autistic. We know in looking at the, the autism data, boys are much more represented. Um, my understanding is that's different with PDA. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about, you know, who, who hmm. we're seeing in PDA or are we seeing different, uh, different people represented kind of in the PDA profile? Yeah, I, I don't know if I have the knowledge to talk on okay. that with like what okay. the research shows. I think it'd only be like anecdotal. Gotcha. And from like my own practice, honestly, it's like a lot of white boys still and that could be demographically like where gotcha. I am. Okay. It could I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. I, I I've heard and and, and again, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to say this is fact, but uh I, I've heard that um it's much that, that we're seeing uh, more girls being diagnosed under that PDA umbrella. And, and again, I don't mm. want to be quoted there because I don't know that that's fact, but I was yeah. just kind of curious if you knew uh, any of that, but, no, but that, I'll be that, that, that'll be something to research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably, as soon as we're done, go yep. look it up. Yep. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is like, what is PDA is just like, I get asked a lot. Like if my child's PDA, like, are they doomed? Are like, are they going to never be able to have a job? Are they going to be miserable forever? Like, I, I don't know, like a child who isn't could be miserable when they're an adult. That is what it is. Um, but there's so many positive aspects to that go along with it. And I will never say it's a superpower. That is something that I do not care for that, just like my own thing. Like I don't think PA or any, I don't think any part of what makes our brain our brain is a superpower. Um, but I do think there's a lot of really great characteristics that come with having a PDA autistic nervous system and neurotype. And so I think that's important to recognize, but I'm not gonna talk more about it because time, because I wanna get to this, <laughs> which I'll just talk about really briefly. And then everybody go look up the Panda graphic here so you can learn more about it. Um, but this graphic comes from PDA Society and it's got the acronym Panda and it's a really great way to support PDAers. Also, I have some signs here for you because I know that might be small, but really, if we just think about like felt safety and like, does this person feel safe? Do they have a connection to somebody? Do they have a relationship they can rely on? That is something that can bring somebody back online when they are melting down really fast. And it's really hard if someone's telling you to go fuck yourself to turn around and look to try to make connection with them. But a lot of nervous systems need that. And in the correct way for that person's nervous system, right? So it's gonna look different, but we have to think about their safety and connection first. And in therapy, that's huge, right? As a therapist, like I didn't know, but like a lot of times I'm focused on rapport building way more than I'm focused on a therapeutic intervention. And apparently that was creating lots of safety with autistic and PDA clients that I've had because it's important. And we lose that in so many other places in work, right? With adults, in school, with kids. We really lose this idea of like connection and internal sense of safety. I hear all the time, but this is safe. This is a safe place. Schools, like we just can't say they're safe anymore overall period, I don't think. Even if a classroom feels safe to the teacher, it's probably not feeling safe to every student in there, maybe not even half, right? We have to start thinking about this and starting to figure out how to support nervous systems. Collaborating huge right like dr ross green we have collaborative proactive solutions i know there's also like colla collaborative problem solving is that also yes so like yep. there's lots of different things that are teaching us how to start listening to kids and collaborating with them not when they're melting down but before a meltdown or after a meltdown looking back how can we help next time and really listening to what they're saying because if we give people the skills to understand the strategies to understand themselves in a way that works for their brain and we listen and we're curious a lot of times they can tell us what they need i think when we think of kids and teens we just don't listen to them or we're not willing to give up our own beliefs we're concerned we're scared for their future and so we don't listen and so when you're working with someone who has a pa nervous system that is very quick to have this like overdrive, autonomic, automatic, 
unintentional response to a demand, we know that it's important to pick our battles, to enable some sense of choice, to really focus on anxiety management in a way that keeps their anxiety manageable, keeps them feeling safe so that they can navigate demand. When I was doing this presentation and finalizing it, I wasn't really doing a lot of other things around my house. And when I had to or thought I had to, it was really stressful. And so when we're working and living with and teaching PDAers, we have to recognize that like when we're asking them to do one thing, we're pulling on their energy, we're pulling on their nervous system. And then when we ask them to do five more things along with that one thing, it creates a huge, huge overwhelm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, negotiation and collaboration, I touched on a little bit. It's just so important to like really work with people. Um, disguising and managing demands, I think is also something that can be really helpful. I also think we have to respect people's nervous systems and if that works for them or not. Like some people, indirect language does work really well. And sometimes indirect language can be triggering because it might feel like some kind of mental gymnastics to figure out what that person wants, right? So we have to think about that. Um, but we know like declarative language is something that's talked about a lot with supporting PDAers. Um, adapting, we've talked so much about that, just learning to be adaptable. And I think the real big thing is curiosity. I definitely am rushing through this because I want to be respectful of time, but this is a graphic that's out there on the internet. PDA Society has lots of really awesome resources. I'm not not talking about PDA NA for any reason. I just, before they had some stuff going on, I paid more attention to this website. So that's why I pulled more from mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they have great resources. Um, but I did put a word of caution at the bottom because I do think it's really worth noting. Like if you are going into interacting with a PDA or and your real goal is you're getting them to be compliant, but you're showing up and pretending like you want to co-regulate or help them feel safe or manage their anxiety, but like deep down, you just want them to do the thing, they're probably going to know. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not going to work out the way you want. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave you with that, lots of learning. Um, I put some references and resources, again, not a comprehensive list, threw this together um, best I could with like all the disorganized scattered resources I have. Um, and I just think hopefully we wanna continue learning and implementing what we know, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm trying to think of the book and I wanna say it was Low Demand Parenting, um, mm -hmm. a, a book I'd recently uh, been been reading and, and it's like, you know, a, a lot of this is about like even knowing when to drop a demand. I mean, you know, um, very often, you know, it's like dying on the hill, right? We're we're gonna we're gonna continue to push that compliance, and right. you know, this is what leads to escalation, right? Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, you've got a lot of resources yeah. here. Oops. Oh wow, Sorry. yeah, a lot of a lot wow. of resources, and of course, you've made that. Um, you, you made your presentation available to folks that want mm -hmm. to download it. And uh, maybe Courtney, if you can share that link one more, uh, I, I should Did say, I put here, it back right? up? Uh, no, I was going to have, I was going to have Courtney behind the scenes, Courtney, because we have two Courtney's here. Oh. Uh, our, my, my assistant Courtney, who's behind the scenes. And of course you, and, and before we were doing a better job, with that. but anyway, uh, I think it will put up the link here as well. Um, yeah, th this, this has been a, a fantastic conversation. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate you, um, kind of diving into this and, uh, you know, uh, I was listening to you describe kind of the, uh, uh, you know, just the demands of putting this presentation together and, and to some degree, uh, I can relate to you. I just got back from a conference in, uh, Dallas and, uh, you know, I had a presentation that I had months to get ready. And of course, um, I had lots of, uh, things that, uh, were on my agenda before that. And even coming down to the last week, you know, I, I found myself sometimes, uh, you know, working on everything but the thing that I really needed to get done and I could relate, oh, yeah. but also to, to the, the, uh, the stress and anxiety of, of doing that as well. And of course, uh, you know, I'm sorry to, you know, sorry to, to put you through that, but I'm glad that no. you've, 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 you've done this and put it together. Uh, it's a really great yeah. presentation. We're Thank having you. more and more people reach out with questions about PDA and, and, um, I think more and more recognition of, of this, which I think is a yeah. positive thing. Um, but now we need to get to people like, what are the strategies? What are the things that you can do? You know, how do you support people? And, and yeah. I happen to, I happen to believe that a lot of the things that you're going to do, um, are going to be similar to things that we should be doing for a lot of people. And, and as you yep. talk about kind of nervous system, <laughs> uh, you know, really it's, it's prioritizing safety and it's, 
uh, kind of, you know, it's, it's that, you know, kind of co-regulation piece. And there, there's so many things that we should be doing. So yeah. um, as we wrap up here, because I know we are, we are a little longer than uh, I Sorry. told you I would keep you. Oh, no, no, no need to apologize at all. Uh, this has been a fantastic um, conversation. But I just want to give you a chance. Is there any, are there any final words that you want to leave us with? And we're, we're getting some really nice comments in here as well. Um, you know, so great, great to see. Um, but any final words that you want to leave us with as we wrap up today? Oh, I don't know if I have any life changing final thoughts. I think just like encouraging everybody to stay curious and to keep looking at different, like learning about ourselves, learning about other possibilities, just continuing to do like the really hard work that we're being asked to do, I think as humans in general right now. Um, and I'm always available as a resource. I'm not always phenomenal at getting back to emails in a timely manner, but I try really hard. Um, my contact information is at the beginning of this, and I'm happy to try to connect if there's some kind of support or resources or questions that people have. But there's also people that know a lot more than me that I would probably direct them to. Um, you, you know, you. The, the, the curiosity, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in curiosity. It goes a long way. Uh, and I was in a presentation uh, just a few days ago and somebody brought up a Ted Lasso quote. It was the mm. uh, be curious, not judgmental. And mm. uh, I think it applies to so much of this. It's like yeah. move away from, you know, kind of judging and making decisions and, and all of that. Um, and, and curiosity can go a long way. And when you're curious, you you ask questions and you connect and you do so many things that can lead you in a far better direction. Uh, Absolutely. This has been a fantastic conversation. Again, uh, people you. still put in, putting uh, great comments in here as well. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank yeah. you for all the time that you've given us. We're going to go ahead and, and wrap this up. I want to, I want to ask you if you'll just stick around for one more second mm -hmm. and uh, we were, we will actually let our uh, audience here go, but thank you so much for joining us and we will see everybody again here next time. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. All right.